Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, hope everyone found that main stage opening as inspiring as I did. Uh, truly uh, so inspired to see all of you checking in from all across the world. I am Ellen Morehouse. I am the communications director here at the Women's Funding Network. I use she, her pronouns. And I am so proud to have been on this planning committee for Women Funded 2021. Uh, we are so excited that y'all are joining us today from all corners of the globe um, and across, quite frankly, the world. So we're looking forward to stellar content and meaningful conversations together in this session. So uh, let's get started right away with some of that content. The session you've joined us for is purposeful partnering towards freedom from violence. Uh, and with no further ado, I will let our wonderful speakers take it from here. Nice to meet you. Hello. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Nicolette Naylor, and I'm the International Director for Gender, Racial, and Ethnic Justice at the Ford Foundation. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm being beamed to you from Johannesburg, South Africa. Welcome. Uh, I hope you're all excited to be here today, and I think that opening session was just on fire. So we're looking forward to, to this session, where we're going to be doing a deep dive and talk about purposeful partnership to address sexual and gender-based violence at the global level. And we're going to do this at a practical and political level, where we're going to be able to learn more about a global partnership between Me Too International and the Global Fund for Women to address SGBV. But let me just set the scene a little bit. Uh, indulge me for a moment. Um, we know that thanks to the work of the Me Too movement, there's a global conversation around gender-based violence happening. And resources and funding is flowing to the issues of GBV. But, and this is a big but, this is not translating into resourcing for black and brown feminists around the world. Uh, in 2018, out of nearly 70 billion in foundation giving globally, less than half of a 1%, less than 0.5%, went to black feminist social movements. That's shocking when we're all talking about disrupting patriarchy and uh, anti-blackness and white supremacy. We want to disrupt these things. And then less than 1%, less than half a percent is going to black feminist social movements. One grant was given to support international black feminist organizing. So this, I'm hoping we can talk about this as well, but working at that global level and supporting black feminist organizing is something that uh, we, we need to grapple with as feminists. And as feminist funders, we have a duty to keep asking ourselves who's being rendered invisible or marginalized within our feminist practice and within our feminist discourse and how are we engaging with black feminists, the disability movement, the trans movement, who continue to be rendered invisible and marginalized in our conversations. Um, and we also know that sexual and gender-based violence is a global phenomenon that persists everywhere in the world. Yet we struggle to address this problem at the global level. We struggle to make the connections and build alliances and solidarity between what's happening in the United States with what's happening in other parts of the world, particularly the global south. And as funders, we want to see collaboration and partnership, but we don't always want to fund it. We like to see it, but we don't always want to fund it. And we find it hard to get our heads around global movements and global networks and solidarity. And now more than ever, the world needs to think about solidarity across borders. Um, COVID has taught us that. The gender-based violence movement has taught us that. Um, and I think we need to start looking to movements that are working in an explicitly global and intersectional way. So I'm really honored to be sitting with two passionate feminist leaders in Laurie and Danny, who are going to talk us through and really showcase for us an example of global, holistic, intersectional approaches if we want to address sexual and gender-based violence. And I'm going to ask these amazing leaders to introduce themselves to you be, before we kick off. So over to you, Laurie. Thank you so much, Nicolette, for framing that. Um, I almost feel like 
in some ways you've you've said everything right there that that's that was everything it was so important thank you and uh hello to everyone i'm i'm so pleased to be having this conversation with you all today uh, my name is Lori Edelman. I use she, her pronouns, and my title is Vice President, Influence and Engagement at Global Fund for Women. And what that means is that I work within communications, strategic partnerships, and advocacy um, to support our mission and vision. And what that is at Global Fund for Women is that we're working towards a world in which power and privilege for a few has been transformed into equity and equality for all. So that's the North Star. And the other thing that I just wanted to share in terms of, you know, just kind of introductions, getting to know each other better. Um, you know, I'm coming to you from Brooklyn, New York. Most of my colleagues at Global Fund for Women are on the West Coast of the US in San Francisco. And a lot of my work since joining the organization two years ago has been around supporting the implementation of our new strategic plan in which we're really doubling down, Nicolette, to your point, um, around supporting movements and supporting collective action and really looking at that forest and not only the trees. So one of the reasons that I'm so excited that this work has brought me to be in partnership with Danny and the Me Too movement and yourself as well, Nicolette, is uh, but another part of my personality is I'm also really passionate about digital media and advocacy, and I'm just a strong believer in the power of this media as an important and often very underlooked um, tool in the feminist toolbox. So I previously ran a Feministing, which was an independent blog um, that at its peak, it saw over a million unique monthly visitors. And that was something where I was able to see every day the impact of building feminist tech, supporting diverse young feminists to have their voices infiltrate the landscape and what that can do. So that made me even more in awe of the Me Too team, what they've been able to achieve and change and make possible. And so I'm just thrilled to be part of this conversation today and to be lifting up this partnership and cracking it open a little bit um, to share with the good folks here. So with that, I will pass it over to you, Danny. Great. Um, thank you so much. Really um, glad to be here. Nicolette, thank you so much for framing uh, the conversation that way. I think, um, you know, your leadership and your work um, definitely speaks for itself. And, and I'm excited to be in this conversation with you and with Lori. And uh, Lori and I have gotten to know each other very well over the last couple of years and um, excited to talk about the partnership that we've developed together. Um, my name is Danny Ayers. I use pronouns she and her. I uh, serve as CEO of Me Too International. Uh, which is the um, organization that undergirds the work of the Me Too movement. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about um, our work in a moment, but um, you know, me, the Me Too movement is obviously made up of many more organizations and individuals than just um, Me Too International. And we are proud to be in relationship with many of them and are continuing to build relationships. We know that gender-based violence uh, advocacy work to interrupt and end this global public health crisis did not start with um, the Me Too hashtag in 2017. There are so many amazing activists and organizers across the globe who have been working on this issue um, long before the hashtag went viral. And we are just um, excited to continue to bring attention and bring demand um, to the issue and you know, really try to elevate the work that's happening and that has been happening across the globe. Um, my background is actually inside of sort of building um, social justice movement infrastructure. Uh, it's a, a passion that I um, developed early on in my career. And uh, when Tarana Burke asked me to join her in building out the organization that supports the work of the Me Too movement, I of course could not find any reason at all to say no to that. Um, and it has been an amazing journey um, building the plane while we are absolutely flying it. And um, I started out as COO, as Chief Operations Officer, uh, really 
building out those that foundational infrastructure that every movement needs to be successful and healthy and then sort of evolved into the CEO role as as the foundation was settled. So I'm just excited to be here. Um, and in this conversation, I'll kick it back to you, Nicolette. Thank you so much, Danny and Laurie, and welcome everyone. Uh, keep talking to us in the chat and we will be leaving some time for discussion as well. I'm going to kick off with some questions for our panelists. Um, maybe tell us a bit about how both your organizations have approached the work on sexual and gender-based violence um, within the, the structure of your organizations and how that's led to this kind of powerful partnership. But first start with your, your individual approaches to, to the work and then we can talk a bit about the partnership. So Laurie, do you want to kick us off? Sure, thank you so much for that. Um, so at Global Fund for Women, we are a feminist funder and we distribute grants. Most of them are core, unrestricted and multi-year. That's a key part of our practice and principles. And um, in the last fiscal year, those grants funded key impact areas including sexual and reproductive justice, economic justice, adolescent girls, and, and crucially, freedom from violence, among other things. Um, and what we've really been seeing, Nicolette, and what's really informed a lot of our approach to sexual and gender-based violence specifically is, you know, the you mentioned it at the top of this meeting, but the COVID-19 pandemic has just underscored so much of what we already know about how systemic inequity is just built in to our world and how especially women and girls and all historically exploited and marginalized communities are just, you know, facing, experiencing the disproportionate impact of that. And we say it over and over, but I just think it's so important to keep that top of mind that um, the impact of these multiple and overlapping crises are not equally felt. And so when it comes to gender-based violence, we've seen such a ripple effect of these crises, um, disrupted educational opportunities, severe economic hardships, which have long-term consequences and overlap with sexual and gender-based violence. So we try to take that intersectional approach um, and, you know, we look at supporting grantee partners who are working at the front lines of these crises. Um, so we provide both those short-term grants to address immediate needs, as well as those multi-year grants that I mentioned. And the last thing that I'll just say um, is that the amazing work that I've been so humbled and honored to be part of with the Me Too movement, it's part of a broader um, effort at the organization um, in which we're piloting a new movement-led approach under that new strategy. And so one way that we're approaching work on sexual and gender-based violence is to actually be honest about the fact that we need to have an adaptive mindset. We're learning, um, we're growing, and that we want to be co-creating. To Danny's point about building that plane as we are flying it, um, and there's kind of three elements that we're really thinking about in terms of, as a funder, keeping an adaptive mindset to any of the work that we're doing, not just work around sexual and gender-based violence. So one, acknowledge that this is new territory. We don't have all the answers. I think so often funders, you know, are, are pressed to be in this place where they're saying, you know, we did it, um, success, congrats to all. And so, you know, we figured it out. That is not what we're um, trying to communicate. Um, two, it's so important to actively be seeking different perspectives. So you'll hear later on about some of the work that we've done with Me Too to do that, but really thinking about who's not in the room, who's outside of our existing networks that can help inform our approach to sexual and gender-based violence and all of our work. Um, and then three, be willing to stop or change course when new information emerges and whatever initial assumptions that we thought we had are no longer valid. And so those are kind of some of the mindset approaches that we're bringing um, to the work around sexual and gender-based violence, including the work um, with the Me Too movement. Thanks, Laurie. I love that adaptive mindset and co-creating. Danny, tell us a bit about the, how Me Too International is approaching the work on SGBB. Yeah, thank you. Um, so many folks um, know about the Me Too hashtag and kind of how it was 
globally used to identify individuals who had experienced sexual violence. Um, and But what we do also know is that the hashtag has been co-opted in some ways, has been used for other things that have nothing to do with social justice um, or sexual gender-based violence. And so our work, what, what we realized was that we really did need an organizational infrastructure to continue the work of what Me Too is actually about. And from a very sort of core, um, straightforward way in terms of understanding our work is about healing and our work is about action to interrupt and end sexual violence. And we see both of those as key and crucial to interrupting and ending um, this issue. And so our work is built around those two premises. We set out when we first started the organization to build out a set of resources for individuals who had experienced sexual violence. Part of what we've heard from survivors over the years is that so often folks don't have access to the resources that they need to heal. And so we hired a team of researchers and built out a set of healing resources that actually still lives on our website now and is searchable by zip code in the United States, across the country, from rural to metro. And we continue to put muscle behind that to add resources there regularly. Um, the other piece of that work is that we our healing programs are set up to engage survivors who are anywhere along their healing journeys. We know that survivors are not a monolith, exist across a spectrum, and we wanted to develop programming that would allow folks to access their own healing wherever they are in their journey. Um, and so we have programs like survivor leadership training. We host a, a webinar series that was developed during the pandemic where we know that uh, survivors were experiencing um, sexual violence at higher rates, intimate partner violence was up, and we wanted to do something to reach folks. Um, that series was incredibly successful and we're going to continue offering it. Um, we also house uh, a, a survivor sanctuary that's launching here in the next couple of months where it's a self-guided kind of healing journey that'll exist um, for folks globally that want to access content <clears throat> at their own pace. Um, and then our partnerships is a I mentioned before that you know there are lots of folks working on this issue and our what we know is that folks know the me too name um, we're a highly visible uh, movement and we really want to be in community with other folks who are doing this work and so we've set out to develop projects like the survivors agenda that was about engaging those 12 million survivors who tweeted me too in the 24 hours after the hashtag went viral and how do we engage those folks as a community uh, a community that has power um, and can influence and demand for change. And so that work is in partnership with National Women's Law Center um, and a coalition of about 30 organizations that are working to advance um, the issues that survivors need to have addressed and are demanding to have addressed from policy level to social level to cultural level. Um, we also know that cultural and narrative shifting is an important part of this. We know that folks um, who aren't inside this work may not understand the prevalence of the spectrum of rape culture. The things that when they're, then they're allowed to happen can lead to violence. And so part of our work is around the action of educating folks about the issue of sexual violence and how the pervasiveness of things like catcalling and harassment in the workplace, um, and even things like not using folks' proper pronouns lead to violence. And, um, and so we have a platform called Act Two that has 
over a thousand actions on it that can be accessed globally, um, whether it's listening to a podcast to learn about sexual violence, um, reading a book or watching a movie, to volunteering at a rape crisis center or taking a bystander intervention training. These are things that actually materially shift people's minds into understanding the issue better and being able to show up as disruptors um, in their lives. Um, so, you know, our work is really about dismantling the stigma that exists around sexual violence being an individual experience and, and helping folks to understand that this is actually a community issue that we need to resolve together in partnership with each other across movements. Um, and so I'll, I'll stop there. I could keep going, but let me stop there. <laughs> That's perfect. Thank you, Danny. I, I think the work has been so inspiring, the work that you do um, to just put survivors at the center. Um, we often do this work ignoring survivors' needs and, and healing and action. But tell us a bit about what brought this partnership, why the partnership. We've got the Feminist Fund, the Global Fund for Women, a feminist funder with Me Too International. What made you decide to enter? We know partnerships are hard. So tell us a bit about why you entered into this partnership and maybe also some of the, the work you've done so far before we talk about challenges. And we will talk about channel challenges as well because we, we don't want to romanticize partnerships. But let's start um, with why you entered into this partnership and, and some of the work that you've done. Danny, I wonder if you want to take it first and and I can jump in, share our origin story with the group here. Yeah. Yes. Um, so Tarana Burke had received the Sydney Peace Prize back in 2019 and had met a board member from the Global Fund for Women who said, you all need to be in relationship with Global Fund for Women. Um, I didn't mention this, but Me Too has a, a Black feminist framework for our work. Um, we've always centered Black women and girls at the core of this work and all communities of color uh, and, and also all marginalized communities, not to the exclusion of anyone else, but we know when those communities are served, all communities are served. And so um, we can't, Toronto came back from Sydney and uh, we uh, extended an you know, outreach and connection to Global Fund for Women. And we actually met and had dinner and there was just such synergy in our approach to the work. Um, and when we, when we talked about our desire to engage with some of the global organizers who had reached out to us since the hashtag had went viral, um, we said, you know, we would love to engage with, with Global Fund for Women because they have such a legacy of global engagement around issues affecting women, but also just gender-based violence specifically um, across the globe. And so we, um, we really wanted to sort of gain their knowledge and make sure that we were going to approach this work from the framework that we have um, committed to and understanding that Global Fund for Women has such similar values and principles. It just... Uh, evolved into, uh, you know, why don't we partner on this work together? At that point, um, you know, it was prior to the pandemic. And so we sought out to really think about what this work could be, um, because our deep desire was to be in relationship with these um, organizers and activists doing such important work on the ground, many of them way before the hashtag went viral. Um, but we're finding that the Me Too movement in the US and now sort of spanning globally was making things possible for them that they hadn't seen prior. And so they, you know, we really wanted to figure out how do we add momentum and value to their work. And we thought Global Fund for Women is, is the best organization for us to partner with to figure that out. I think, I mean, Danny, you covered so much there. I mean, there's so much to, to chemistry and, and, you know, being around people that you kind of intrinsically, you know, trust and connect with and, and want to build a relationship off of that before the work begins. I think sometimes in our field, uh, we, we skip over that part. And if it looks good on paper, you know, we, we try to move it forward. But there was so much to that and just the, the warmth and the synergy even between you know, Tarana and Latanya um, on down. Um, but I just also 
also want to build on that, you know, to those who might be uh, fellow funders in the room, um, from a funding perspective, you know, the Me Too movement was such a dream partner in so many ways for us um, as a feminist fund that's looking to support collective action to pilot a movement-led approach. Um, so much of the criteria we were looking for in partnership was there. Um, not only was this a movement that already had made such an incredible, huge, mind-blowing, once-in-a-generation impact, um, but there was that existing relationship. The movement already was centering those diverse, um, those diverse actors that already had this framework around marginalization um, that matched our own. And we saw that the need was great and there was a lack of appropriate donor attention. I mean, can you imagine if a cis white man had started a conversation as large as the one that happened with Me Too? I mean, people would be throwing money at this person for the rest of their lives um, and never look back. And the the sad truth of our world, and I, I Danny would never say it this way, so I'll say it this way. Um, you know, the sad truth of our world is that um, very often, um, you know, cis white men get invested in based on what people see as their potential, whereas so many of the rest of us have to prove ourselves first with no resources um, before people will even start to wake up to that. And I think so as a feminist funder, we also were seeing, you know, Me Too was kind of in everyone's mouths, but not necessarily out of their pockets for it. And so I'm just, we really felt honored and privileged um, to be able to, you know, try to correct some of that um, in partnership um, with, with Danny and, and the whole team. Thank you so much, Laurie. Maybe you could tell us a bit about uh, the global survey that you've undertaken, the work you've been doing together that's so exciting um, in terms of just hearing from people around the world. So Danny, do you want to kick us off on talking a bit about the work that you've been doing together, particularly taking this from the US to the global? Yeah, um, it, it was part of our, part of the spirit of this partnership was that we did not want to um, engage and begin to engage with um, global organizers and activists around this work, um, prescribing what this would be. We really wanted to listen and learn first and really try to come from um, a very humble place. Um, and, and so the way that we figured out, we figured we could do that in, in a phase one was by um, conducting a survey um, as well as conducting um, a set of consultations with individual organizations. And so um, developing the survey took more time, I think, than we thought. Uh, we, we really wanted to figure out um, how would it be really useful information without um, overburdening folks, um, you know, surveys, come out all the time. We know folks are asked to respond to things all the time, but also really wanting it to be meaningful information. Um, if folks are gonna do a survey, let's make sure that it's meaningful. And so um, Global Fund for Women um, has such a massive um, community of folks that they've supported and have been in relationship with over the years. We sent a survey to close to 500 um, organizations and surprisingly, we got responses back from close to 420 um, organizations. And, and that is, in my experience, unheard of uh, in a survey. And so it really spoke to us, just that number in itself, that folks wanted to communicate um, with us and, and wanted to share their experiences, their desires, um, and challenges. And so um, we were very excited to see the response. Uh, the, the survey was translated in five languages so um, that we could really try to get a large a swath of the global community to uh, talk to us. And so um, 
we took uh, a couple of months with an amazing global consultant to evaluate those responses and, and now have kind of a core set of data um, in terms of things that we've learned from from these global actors. And it's um, it's really exciting and will essentially lay a foundation for us in terms of what are folks, uh, deep their deep desires, um, what are they looking for, where can we actually add value um, to individuals and organizations on the ground. And that is our, you know, one of the things that we've been really committed to from the beginning, wanting to only add value um, to folks' work. Laurie, do you want to add to what, what Danny set out? Yeah, I mean, I think Danny covered it really well. And we were so pleased with that um, completion rate and the fact that folks took an average of over 40 minutes to complete the survey. I mean, to me, it just shows the need and the interest and speaks to the, the power of the partnership. And, and really, to me, too's credit and to Danny's credit, they could have just said, listen, we're getting all these emails from people and we're getting responses from people around the world and we will just kind of put them on a listserv and make them fit into what we're already planning. And so to step outside of that, um, we were we were really thrilled to be able to be a part of that. Um, and you know, one of the things I thought was really powerful about the consultations is that um, we stepped into those um, and half of them were um, sort of with folks who maybe self-identified as either part of or wanting to be part of um, the kind of Me Too movement um, in a very straightforward traditional sense. And half of those were fo folks who are working on sexual and gender-based violence in some way or another. Um, and their direct relationship to Me Too was less clear. And so I think there's a lot of power in that and not saying, here's how you have to identify, but actually asking, how do you identify? Because to Danny's point, this work has been going on. And we saw that with the survey responses. You know, folks have you know, been doing this work for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Um, and so some of the wisdom and, and the issues that they're identifying, um, we really want to make sure we're not missing that and we're incorporating it into, um, you know, design of our partnership from the very early stages. Thank you so much. I think this gets to the, the purpose, the purposeful partnership approach. Um, often there's assumptions that one can just take what we're doing in the US and let's just multiply it and apply it everywhere in the world, which is both patronizing and offensive to those of us in the global south. And we also know I work in the in the African context and survivors want to be connected they want to be connected they want to be in community and have collective approaches so well done in terms of just recognizing the need but also doing it slowly and not jumping in saying we have the answers we know how to do this we're going to take what we've already been doing in the us and just multiply it by by multiple regions um i want us to get real now <laughs> let's get a bit real and we know it's important to be working in this solidarity mode of working and partnership and being purposeful and thoughtful. But we know that there's also challenges building global networks. It's hugely challenging um, and it's not without its tensions at a range of political and ideological levels. And if you throw in uh, the, the global, including global north and global south, um, there, are, there are tensions there. Talk to us a bit about some of the, the big challenges and some of the smaller challenges, um, because often those challenges make funders step back and say, we shouldn't go there because it's too difficult. Tell us about that it's been difficult, but we also know you're doing this and, and you're doing well. So talk us through that. And I'm going to, I want to hear both of you challenges from your different organizational perspectives. I can jump in first. Um, yeah, this, this is, um, a you know a long uh, sine wave that we are on. Um, you know it's the old framing that if you you want to go um, fast, you can go alone. If you want to go far, you go together, right? And so we we are on this journey together. Um, I would say that the foundation that has helped us through a lot of the challenges that I'll kind of name is is coming is naming what our values are from the beginning 
and always referring back to them. Um, that has helped us get through a lot of the challenges as we've looked at, because it's a massive undertaking to think about building a global network. Um, I would say that for me and for, for me too, our, our biggest concern has been around the safety, um, safety for the organizations and individuals on the ground. They are in varying states of, you know, a danger. And, you know, we, we, one of our very first questions for groups is, you know, what is your experience with danger on the ground? What do you have to be aware of? Um, you know, we, we ha are in a position to where we don't have to worry in the U.S. often, often at least, about challenges with with safety the way that global other global folks do, um, especially in the global south. And so um, how do we engage with these folks in meaningful ways um, when they're, you know, can't when they we can't save anything digitally. Um, everything needs to be sort of on paper. Um, we have to be really careful when we begin meeting with folks in in uh, person where that actually happens. Um, in some cases, it can't be in their home countries. It has to be somewhere else. Um, and so I take that with great responsibility that, you know, as we're engaging, there may be danger involved and and we have to take that into consideration and it does require us to move slower um and it does require more resources and more individuals to be you know so in support on how we can ensure safety and we're still you know there is still some risk in in doing this work um that's one of the biggest challenges that we've already experienced and we are absolutely going to experience as we begin meeting with folks in person which is been the desire um, all along. Um, we started virtually because of the, obviously the pandemic. Um, I'll kick it to you, Lori. I have another couple of thoughts, but I want to make sure I leave time for you to jump in. Absolutely. And I think, you know, do no harm. It's, a, it's such a key principle, everything you said. Um, I just want to take it down to the micro level because I don't know if some folks kind of will relate to this, but you know, partnership across organizations, to Danny's point, it takes time, it takes trust, it can be tedious at times. I mean, if one organization uses Box and one uses Google Docs, as we do, you know, that can cause some annoyances and could cause bigger issues as well. Like to Danny's point, how are we storing information digitally? That was actually a question we had to do some research around and figure it out together. What's the safest way to share information um, that might be sensitive? Uh, we have different procurement policies. Um, we need to budget for language translation to ensure that we have language justice and our budgeting processes are happening at you know at different times or we we look at this in different ways so all of those things are real and i think it's important to build in time um, to explore those things and build trust and at a bigger picture level structurally in philanthropy i i cannot say enough you know we we do not um build in enough time to build the trust build the relationships before you start getting asked for deliverables and, and after deliverables. So what did you do? What did you accomplish in this period? As Danny said, we started these conversations pre-COVID. Basically nothing has gone according to plan. Um, maybe that's something you all can relate to as well, but um, we've, we've adapted and shifted a lot since the beginning of this partnership. And um, you know, we need to be able to communicate out to all the different stakeholders who are involved in this, including the people who took part in the survey, and we want to be reporting out to them in timely ways. So um, I think time, uh, budgeting time and being patient with each other and taking the time to build trust in the relationship is just so important. And structurally, it is not incentivized. So we need to make that space for ourselves. I think just to just to mm -hmm. double click on one thing you said, organizational pace is such an is such an important thing that we don't often think about when we go into partnerships. But you know, Me Too is as an organization is is young and is small. You know, we're a staff of eleven, will be twelve um, shortly, 
that is a you know a much smaller staff and 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 younger in terms of organizational institutional memory um, than than Global Fund for Women, and so that just causes a very different organizational pace. Um, and we have we had to sort of take that into consideration and continue to um, as we move forward and constantly sort of check in on you know does this work for you. Uh, and, you know, and does it work for us? Because we can sort of make assumptions about another group being able to move at the rate that we move. Um, and, and you just can't do that inside of a, a partnership if you want it to really be successful and for it to sort of to maintain the level of trust and thoughtfulness that really will result in the work that you produce. Thank you. Let's keep keep getting real. Um, let's talk about resourcing and how the how resourcing it, what kinds of challenges you faced as organizations that are steeped in black feminist perspectives, um, and also whether you've gotten any pushback in terms of funding where people are saying, well, we're happy to fund the US work, but don't talk to us about the global, or we want to fund the global south, but we don't want to fund the US. Um, you know, the silos that we funders have in our heads around um solidarity and alliance building? Have you found that challenging at all? And also just being explicit about your black feminist perspective often has ramifications for funders. So talk to us about those challenges. And we're gonna open it up for Q&A. Please type some questions in or, you know, we, we're gonna, in the next five minutes, we'll, we'll open it up, but you can start typing questions in the chat if you'd like to. Danny, did you want to kick this one off? Uh, sure. I was just going to say that, you know, because you highlighted earlier, Lori, which thank you for saying that about, um, you know, our what our the funding landscape has looked looks like to meet you as an organization. Um, you know, we we often are in, engaged with folks who who imagine that this work is well resourced, um, and and it's and it's just not factually. Um, we have a very visible name um, and we do not have the the kind of resourcing that um, you know we're 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 building we do not have reserves you know for those in the room or development folks you know we we very much are raising our budget um, each month or each year and so what we have found is that although folks you know as we're in conversation with funders um, there is interest in what we're doing that resulting in really funding the work especially at the point at which we are now which is really planning and and really sort of designing what this work will be um we heard lots of folks say we'll come back when you are at the programmatic level where you're, you know, we've got material things that are happening, right? And I'm like, well, actually this, this piece is, is crucial to that piece. Um, and there does seem to be sort of a lack of, of understanding on the investment in, in the part and the planning piece that we're doing now. Um, the other thing is that, you know, we've seen, especially in the US movement of money to black led organizations in the wake of all of the uprisings around violence against black bodies. And I, you know, we in that moment, as Me Too, a black led orga organization, a black women led organization um, with a black focus um, in terms of our work, expected that funders would um, be engaging with us as we saw millions of dollars moving. Um, and we didn't have any engagement really around um, when we saw these sort of millions of dollars moving to black led organizations. And it really was this striking reality that that so many folks do not see the intersection between racial justice and sexual violence. It is such a it, it is it is truly a piece of um, education that folks need in terms of understanding these connections. They Folks don't know that the second most reported um, complaint against the police is sexual violence. It's only second to excessive force. 
folks don't know that and can't and and to understand that interconnection that we cannot solve racial justice if we don't solve the issue of gender based violence period and and so the more that we we're you know we're on a mission to do a whole bunch of funder briefings because we we realize there is a lack of education around these issues um at the philanthropic level and so um yes we we are you know we are while raising money also trying to educate philanthropy <laughs> Ooh, that is such a word. And I just, I can't emphasize enough like what Danny just said. And I would also put it to the folks in this room and invite everybody in this room to kind of join us, right? Because we need to disrupt this together. What Danny said is so real in philanthropy. And, and I would argue it's both. It's we can't disrupt the racial justice without this. We, we can't advance the racial justice without looking at the gender justice and we can't look at the gender justice without looking at the racial justice those things are hand in hand and the pie just needs to grow for all of us like you heard the statistics that nicolette put at the top of the call and i would just invite people because there are really good stats coming out there's there was that stat i know the black feminist fund and the human rights funders network have a whole report out about this, folks should go check that out. There's very important data for folks who need the data, it's there. But let's just start with a sense that the pie needs to grow for all of us. And, you know, I really, I'm so inspired, you know, by the work of Angela Davis. And she has said, feminism should be capacious, meaning it needs to be inclusive. It needs, we need to understand that the work of feminism cannot only be about gender. And there is a really problematic, experience in our sector about that. And when it comes to violence, we need to really understand how violence happens. So I don't know how many people were seeing in the news, it was all over my newsfeed the past two weeks, this very tragic case, Gabrielle Petito, this woman who was living and you know going around in a van with her boyfriend. And unfortunately, they, they had found her body and the media was covering this 24 seven. This is um, a white woman in America. We know that for every tragic case like that, there are dozens, if not hundreds of black and brown women, trans women, disabled women whose cases are not covered by the media. They're, the, that plight falls on deaf ears. And I just want to lift up, especially, I mean, there was a woman, Dominique Remy Fells. This was a 27-year-old trans woman from Philadelphia who was murdered in 2020. I want to lift up Brianna Taylor a victim of senseless, outrageous police violence. Um, there's a new book by uh, a political scientist, Rafia Zakaria. She's written a book about white feminism in which she shares how she, as a Pakistani woman, came to the US as part of an arranged marriage with an older man who became abusive and how actually it was the American white feminist vilification of the brown male oppressor that actually worked to keep her in that situation longer. Um, and so these are, victims of violence. If we want to solve for violence, um, we need to stop denying Black and brown feminist organizations those resources because we're saying Black lives don't matter. We're saying feminism is for white women. In some cases, we're actually contributing to advancing violence and abuse against women when we keep those verticals all separate and we deny the funding right to intersectional Black and brown feminist organizations. So I'm inviting folks in this room, um, especially the women's funding community, we need to disrupt this together and build this movement from the ground up um, because it, it really, the pie needs to grow for all of us. And so frequently these issues are presented from a scarcity mentality, which is passed down to us through patriarchy, through this hyper-capitalist model that says, if you get, I get less. Um, and we know that actually in philanthropy, that's not true. The resources are there. Um, and it's just that these decisions are shaped by a narrow elite, which um, to Danny's point needs to be educated and, and they need to be um, disrupted so that we can advance this work together. Thank you so much. I want to say preach on, preach on. That was everything we needed to hear. Um, and I know Danny spoke about, you know, educating funders. And I think we need to also start thinking about accountability. How do we hold funders accountable who are speaking the speak and who 
you know, there's a lot of talk around how we want to do our feminist funding in an intersectional way. How do we hold ourselves accountable for that and really look at, well, how much money are we giving to, to black feminists organizing um, and start acting, not talking and only doing solidarity statements, but actually showing showing us the money. Um, there's a question from from the group. Uh, what has surprised both of you most over the course of your partnership? What has been the surprise factor? <laughs> Well, I can, um, that's a great question. I will say that, and I, I'm going to keep thinking about maybe like the at the partnership level, the, the thing that surprised, has surprised me so far um, about starting this partnership and engaging globally is that how, when we did these consultations, um, it was, and even in the survey, I was surprised to see how how much people want to, in my mind, add to their plate, which would mean to be in relationship with us, to 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 do, to create community globally, and and think about that work together, and and. Folks are so busy and are doing. I mean, when we met with these groups, we're like, "How are you doing all of this with so few staff or no staff, just volunteers?" I mean, it was amazing, and yet they want to add another thing in being in community. and And so often, um, we found that folks were working themselves, you know, sick um, and don't have. Aren't, aren't able to prioritize their own health. And so um, I think that the the work, you know, as we approach this, I was thinking about, you know, sort of the material ways that we can be in relationship. And what I've learned is that like, it's community. It's the community piece that folks need um, and, and that they're seeking as well as material resources and all of those other things. I knew those things. Um, it was so clear to me just how the, you know, folks want to be in relationship, want to be building relationship and often are, you know, we knew silos exist, but I thought folks were head down, work, work. They want to be in relationship um, with us. Out of the 420 groups that responded to the survey, only two said that they did not want to be in relationship with us. Um, and so now we have a new challenge, which is, okay, how do we engage with 418 groups? Um, but I, I'll kick it to Lori, but that's, I mean, I've just continually been surprised by that. Absolutely. No, totally plus one, or I'm going to steal. I liked what you said, Danny, double click. Um, maybe that's more for our times. I totally agree with what you said. And I would just add, you know, what surprised me is I think we we were very deliberate and intentional about making space for true diversity in all kinds of ways in terms of who we're engaging and how. Um, and there is diversity. And I think there were a lot of really clear, you know, similarities to Danny's point in the data and that both anecdotal, both qualitative and quantitative, the data that we were getting about um, folks similar situations. And there are some really clear trends and clear needs um, that are shared across very diverse and different organizing contexts um, and, and where folks are looking for support. Um, there's, there's some really bright spots there. Um, and so that was surprising and, and affirming in a way um, because it did, it did actually fit um, you know, we had made enough space for for that to be true. And so I think we're excited to kind of move to the next step um, in terms of meeting um, and working to co-create some things. And I think we're also what's what's also been really surprising is leadership from Global South, um, you know, voices and organizations. So I, I'm really excited for one important next step in this partnership is to support the leadership um, and including, you know, at the strategy level um, of partners outside the U.S. as well, and, and for that to be a really key part of the next phase. Thank you. We've got some questions in the chat. Are the study results posted 
published somewhere. It would be great to see the list of responders. Uh, I think people are wanting. And then some specific examples about the partnerships between organizations, organization structures and size um, that get in the way of working closer together. Danny, do you want to pick up? Sure, I can um, sort of jump off. So um, we we don't have the study results posted anywhere yet. We are sort of thinking about how we are um, going to share the results of the survey. Um, we're going to, we were just meeting about this yesterday, actually. We're going to be doing some exciting things around announcing this partnership. We actually haven't. Um, you sort of officially publicly announced this partnership um, yet. And we're going to do that around the anniversary of the Me Too hashtag, which will be the week of October 18th. Um, the official anniversary is October 15th, but we'll be doing it the week after. And so um, we will be announcing um, our partnership as well as some of the um, results um, from the survey and building out sort of an online um, place for them to live. So that is coming. Um, and, you know, I would just say, and I'm not, I'm, I'm hoping that I, I answer the second question, um, correctly, but I think, you know, we have yet to see some of this. Um, we, we're, you know, beginning to engage with, um, various size, uh, global organizations. We are focusing on the global South first, um, and we are already seeing differentiations in terms of capacity from um, the size of the organizations that we're engaging with. Like I said, some folks don't have any paid staff and are all volunteers. Some folks are working individually um, and some have a team and um, some are more resourced than others. And I know, you know, we know that that's going to have impact on how we work with them um, and their needs. And so part of the challenge of this work is, is determining, you know, our, our continual conversation is maintaining equity across, you know, how we engage, um, but also being able to respond to um, needs where we know that there is a, a sometimes large differentiation between capacity across organizations. And so um, part of the desire of this partnership is to um, not only be creating this community, but to um, move resources to these organizations. We absolutely want to regrant to the folks that we are engaged in conversation with and, and building with. And those some of those considerations around differentiation in capacity and size will be taken into consideration as we do that. Um, but we're very much at the precipice of, of those questions um, and need to, you know, oh yeah. And I think culture, you know, of course, is, is part of this work is that we know, like we bring a very clear framework, right? Um, Global Fund for Women brings a clear framework. We also didn't want to force that framework on any other organization that we engage with. Um, and so that's part of this listening and learning process is to really be able to understand what the spectrum looks like so we can operate from that place instead of, you know, we know what what kind of framework we should build building inside of. Lori, I don't know if you have anything to add. I mean, uh yeah, I, I know we're we're wrapping. So I'll just say, you know, from from our perspective, Me Too is not the only movement that we're working with. So we're also trying to pull learnings and lessons from across um, a number of movement partners that we're in conversation with. And so one of those learnings is really around the need to just increase dedicated staff time for each. Um, for, for this movement-led approach. And so one thing, you know, part of the reason for that is, is culture, is, you know, the difference in structure and size that can get in the way. So um, that's one lesson. And, and we're also looking to publish not only the results of this survey, um, but more broadly around this movement-led approach. Thank you so much. 15 seconds each. Um, how can we help you? Um, you're talking to feminist funders, women funded network in this space. So what is this partnership exclusive? Are you inviting others into this partnership? Uh, 
15 seconds each. <laughs> I want Danny to have the last word, so <laughs> I want to go for it. Um, the answer is yes, we are inviting, uh, we absolutely are inviting partnership. Please do join us. Um, you can learn more at Global Fund for Women's website about the movement led approach, including our work with Me Too. And just want to thank you, Nicolette, for your amazing moderation, for being such a champion for this work. And um, Danny, for letting me bask in your wisdom once again. Um, well, I, I bask as well. You know this um, in yours, Lori. And and I would say that um, we have, we want to, we need to fundraise for this work. It is not funded. Um, we want to invite folks to in conversation with us to learn more. Um, like I said, the week of October 18th, we will be launching and we will be doing a, um, a conversation that talks more about this work and invites um, funding support. So um, reach out to us if you want to um, get an invitation to that event. Um, during that week, uh, we will have Tarana Burke as well as Latanya. Uh, and we'll be talking about, you know, engaging with some of the global partners, but also talking about this work. Um, and Nicolette, just want to say thank you as well. Just so wonderful to have you framing the conversation and holding us in this, you know, dialogue. So much appreciated. Thank you so much. It's been an honor for me to be in conversation with you. And I'll I'll leave everyone. I think this work is so important. The solidarity work is important. When we're fighting together and we're dreaming together, we're going to be stronger together. And the, the global work that you're doing and this movement that you're building um, slowly and with purpose is, is powerful and needs to be supported and resourced. And it's really exciting. So thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who joined the session. Uh, thank you, Danny and Laurie, for your work. And your, you've inspired all of us in, in this space. So thank you. Thank you. Take care.